Okay, everyone, thanks for joining today. Uh, my name is Nick Martin, and, and I'm helping facilitate this session on Singapore launch stories on behalf of the Impact Collective and Draper Startup House. So let me give you an introduction for those of you who may not be familiar with uh, Draper or the Impact um, community. Draper Startup House is a global community for entrepreneurs and was founded by Vikram Bharati, who we have on the call today, in 2017. Uh, when it was known as Tribe Theory. Uh, we've provided accommodation and spaces for work and networking for entrepreneurs who've been launching their businesses around the world. Um, more recently, we set up a venture syndicate uh, which connects startup in, and investors after learning that about almost 50% of our founders in our community were fundraising. Um, in addition to running my own business, I'm a venture partner for Draper Startup House. Um, and in addition to the, the Draper Startup House ecosystem, we're a supporter of entrepreneurs uh, wherever we can, and we are a regional an anchor for the Impact Collective. Um, if you've not come across the Impact Collective, um, for those of you who are not in the program, um, Impact Collective is a community-driven investment um, equity-free accelerator for impact makers. Uh, today, we are focusing on Singapore as a second market as part of the Impact Collective cross-border launch program. Um, of the 86, um, 86 startups that are currently part of the program, almost 30 expressed interest in coming to Singapore. In the prior hour, we spoke with Daniel Spencer from Sleek, who walked through the basics of setting up and being compliant in Singapore, more from the business operations standpoint. And now we're changing gear, and we're gonna share some experiences with three founders who've been there and done that. So um, Vikram, I'm gonna start with you if you'd like to um, give, your, give a warm introduction. We both worked for a fund. Um, you were the investment head and you were leaving as the investment head to start um, what was Tribe Theory um, as I was entering. Um, but we've both been encouraged to start companies and um, we're here to learn a bit more about your experiences today with Draper Startup House. So if you wouldn't mind just starting by introducing yourself for the people on the call. Sure, thanks, thanks for the introduction, Nick. I am uh, the founder of Draper Startup House, as Nick mentioned, which used to be called Tribe Theory. The idea for the company started when I was backpacking around the world uh, in 2014, 15, 16. I was sort of nomading around the world uh, solo and fell in love with spaces, uh, these small community spaces, as you might all know, you know, these backpacker spaces. Um, and I just realized that these were great places for uh, you know networks physical networks and that um, there was an opportunity to repurpose or convert the spaces into uh, hubs for you know entrepreneurship hubs for innovation and that the spaces were currently only being used for travel and tourism but had components for for um, you know these physical networks around building a global network of um, innovation hubs. So there was just a, it was a concept which started in 2018 and now we're in um, nine countries, physical locations around the world. Singapore was our first one. Why Singapore? Well, it was a happenstance to be honest. I never planned to be in Singapore. I met a girl while I was traveling, fell in love. She's, she's now my wife. We were expecting our second child. So it was, it was love and a girl that brought me to Singapore. I had no intentions or, or um, you know, motivation to move to Singapore for business. Um, I had been to Singapore once prior to that. With, and when I was in business school, we had come here for um, like a study abroad, um, uh, one week study abroad program. And I, I, I loved Singapore, I, I thought it was a great place, but I had no intentions of moving here. So yeah, moved here for love. And then when I moved here and started living here, I had an address I realized what a great city it was, how convenient it was, how international it was, how um, you know, it was such a hub for global ideas uh, and global companies. So I fell in love with Singapore, got a job. I was broke when I moved here and I was paying, paying for everything. Uh, and uh, so I needed a job. <laughs> Thankfully, I got a job with uh, the company that Nick used to work at as well and um, really got interest, uh, involved in the startup ecosystem into uh, the investments ecosystem in Singapore and Southeast Asia, and just started really, really loving living here, being here. 
But from a business perspective, um, I started Draper Startup House here in Singapore, and now we're in nine countries. And so the, wait, Nick, am I supposed to also continue on sort of like why, why Singapore from a business perspective or was just- we, we can come to that for sure. I'm, I'm, I think if you want to continue with, it's a good story, but we'll certainly yeah. ask about the why from, from Nima and Will. So. Yeah. But in synopsis, Singapore is a great base camp. It, you know, it's a, it's a great place to set up shop and then start climbing different parts of the, of the great, you know, the El Capitan, I suppose. But it's a great base camp because this is where the money is. This is where the networks are. This is where the big companies are. This is where uh, in the law, you know, the, the, the legal structure is here, rule of law, IP protection, all of the administrative um, uh, environment you need to build a successful global company. Singapore as a market is, of course, very small, but um, it's a great, fantastic hub to, to start a company, build a company, raise money, and um, use this as a base to really, really expand globally. I like the word base camp, and that's a nice segue, I think, to introducing Nima. Um, Nima, when we met, you were coming to Singapore on a scoping mission, if I'm not mistaken, and your company in Europe had reached a unicorn status, and you were looking at, at bringing some of that special magic to Asia. Um, I think by the time I saw you next, you'd not only set up in Singapore, but you'd already started looking at your second market. So do you mind sort of telling us a bit about your story as well? And, and, and it's as interesting, if not more, um, more diverse sort of a set of experiences from coming out here. Um, please, please feel free to like to give us some of your story as well. All right. Uh, yeah, so I, th I think also I was thinking like it's important that I say like what kind of product I'm working with because it's very, yeah. my experience is very connected to the product. So it's a B2C start startup to start with that makes things different than a B2B, obviously. And uh, we're a loan matchmaking platform. So what we do is we connect the right borrower with the right lenders and the borrowers are consumers. That's where the C is coming from. Uh, we do this by uh, facilitating the entire application process. So borrowers come to our website, they apply on our website, they fill out our application form. It's quite long, basically like a loan application form. Then we use that to match, make and find the right offers for that borrower or that applicant at that point. These offers come back to our platform, are presented to, to you now as an applicant. And now you get to choose between multiple pre-approved loan offers and you get to choose the best one, whatever, whichever you want. And once that's done, we send the final signal to the lender that won and say, please proceed with loan disbursement. Uh, so what happens is we've done something that's like really not possible before, which is you fill out one application form, you get multiple loan offers, which is not really a possibility at all in this region. And lenders and banks, they get access to the best customers. They don't have to lift a finger. We do all the work for them, document collection and KYC, everything. They just have to pay out the loan. Uh, so that's our business. And I came here, like this is a model I worked with in Sweden as I was employed at these companies and I, and I wanted to do it myself. Uh, so I brought it here, looking at Singapore as a hub, very similar to what you said already, uh, that for the reasons of rule of law, investors here, uh, and that's, those are really true. I mean, investors are not probably comfortable investing in a, in a Myanmar entity. Like they, they would want to put their money in the Singapore entity. Then the Singapore entity can own a bunch of entities in different countries, that's fine. But that's, this is where they want the, uh, the holding company to be. So that was a given. But eventually being here, I realized this is actually a good place for my consumer business. It's not just where the holding will be, it's actually where I want to have my uh, run the operations as well. So I set up a uh, shop here and then I launched in Malaysia by the time I met you the second time. And by the time I met you the third time, I launched in Thailand. And by the fourth time, it was Hong Kong. So by the end of last year, we were in four markets. Uh, Sing Singapore, Malaysia, Thailand, and Hong Kong. And uh, then COVID happened. We shut down Thailand and Malaysia and kept Singapore and Hong Kong, uh, which some might think like, what? Like the, usually you want to go into these big population markets, but we, there, we have our reasons. And uh, I, I, I want to talk about that as well. Like why Singapore for a B2C business, which usually people would think uh, investors would tell you, when are you doing Indonesia? When are you doing Vietnam? When are you doing, now, nowadays they don't say China or India as much, but they're, they want to look at the big population markets. Well, that's not always the case. Sometimes you can do a great business just focusing on more, smaller markets like Singapore or Hong Kong in our case. Um, I think that, that maybe that's enough for the intro yeah, case. I want to come back on that uh, addressable market dilemma that every founder seems to have when they're talking with the investors. Um, because yes, as you said, you you found a way to, to develop a growing business, but you've gone contrary to some of the logic of, of the investor, let's say. Um, Let's move on, Will. 
you've got the best setup in town. Um, I'm looking forward to hearing um, a bit more from you as well. Um, you've come to Singapore um, much earlier than Vikram and Nima. I think it was 2014, and you, you've come and left, but you've you've got a different path. Do you mind just giving us a bit of intro about who you are, your company, and 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 some of that um, that story as well, please? Yeah. So um, thanks for joining, guys. The reason why I'm in Singapore is because you can have setups like this. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> um, yeah, I moved. I mean, I'm originally from Australia. Um, I moved over uh, to Singapore because of an accelerator um, five years ago. And uh, the reason why I left Sydney at that time was uh, because the startup ecosystem was still emerging. Uh, and my challenge as a first time founder um, and first time entrepreneur was really, you know, who are the right type of people that can help me open doors? How can I learn about business? Um, I had, you know, started a side hustle outside of my day job at a consulting firm and you know the first opportunity to leave um you know my co-founder and i actually took that ticket um so we quit our jobs packed our bags and moved overseas in a matter of days um coming to singapore in 2014 was interesting as well um because at that time the startup ecosystem was starting to flourish um, they were positioning themselves as the gateway to the rest of Southeast Asia. So if you look at the two major Asian hubs, um, five years ago, it was either Hong Kong going to China or Singapore entering the rest of Southeast Asia. Over time, um, the other emerging markets have started to develop, you know, really strong um, backbones themselves. So I've seen sort of Singapore shift and evolve um, over time. Um, I spent about two years in Singapore um, and then I moved my business operations to China and then the Middle East. And I actually decided to come back to Singapore about a year and a half ago to relaunch um, and go deeper. So I run uh, an ed tech company called New Campus. We're looking to build the largest and most inclusive business school in Asia. Um, what we're really trying to democratize is business education. We're providing the value of an elite B school um, education but at the price point of a monthly gym membership. And why we found that very important to be based in a market like Asia is it's really arbitraging everything from government policy to corporates to individual user understanding of higher education. So for us to come back, you know, we've gained a lot of experience over several markets, but it's really how do you line the ducks um, in the education space? Because, you know, I always say doing education um, and doing education startup um, is probably doing a startup on hard mode because it's not just about building a product that users want. It's competing against policy. It's competing against you know, 100-year-old education systems. Um, and why we found um, Singapore being, being really interesting is now, you know, we've developed the relationships to start, you know, influencing education policies, but also building a reputation in a small, high-spending market that has a reputation across the other region. Um, so I can share a bit more about, you know, that expansion strategy. Um, we work a lot with um, entrepreneurs and creators uh, as our speakers. So I can... Um, if you guys have any comments um, and feedback on how you're looking to expand your business, we've, you know, worked with a lot of founders at this later stage um, of their company. So yeah, happy to, you know, that you guys pick my brain, share my thoughts. Fantastic. Uh, we'll certainly come back to that, but Nima, I think um, when you, we may as well tackle the question about um, which market and, and the fact that you in your very early stage, did experiment and test. Um, obviously, COVID's had an impact in terms of, of your strategy, like many of us. Um, but do you mind sort of just walking through how you were able to, to get around so quickly um, and work out what was a suitable strategy for where you are now? So market launch, more or less, like how I decided on the market? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I had, so again, a B2C service, it's, a, it's in the lending space. We're not the lender, but we work with lenders. So keep that in mind. Like, so I'm looking at how do I, which markets do I enter where the conditions are the right for my service. Um, so of course there's the whole desktop research phase, you know, that's not for you on the, you know, checking the interest rate and GDP per capita and household debt and all that. Uh, honestly, there's, there's one thing, there's one trick I have. I say that to investors, this is how I chose my market, but the reality is this, I go to Google search keyword planner and I check how expensive is the word personal loans in the local language, of course. And the more expensive it is, the better. So that means there's competition. That means, that means there's a, there's a, it's a working system. It's a working ecosystem of digital conversions. That's why people are bidding on it. So that's a, 
search for it, kind of, I don't know if you can use it for your business, but just go in there, see, is it expensive, is it cheap? Be careful. It could, it could be very bad to go to that market because obviously this is assuming you haven't figured out something that no one else has figured out. And lenders have figured out how to do online marketing. So I'm not going to be the first there. Um, then I think the next step is, of course, to I, as a startup, one thing we have, we don't have much money. We can't hire McKinsey to help us decide on which market center, but we have ourselves and we can travel. Not right now, but I could then. Uh, so going to the markets, that's a, that's a big step, of course, as an important step to go there and meet as many people. And that's, that's been really cool coming here. I'm from Sweden. Uh, honestly, I met, I, I know like a hundred times more people here in Southeast Asia than I know in Sweden. I, I, my whole life and career is in Sweden because networking is such a thing here and so much easier than, and maybe that says more about Sweden than here, but that, that I used a lot, like a lot of people helped me in the beginning. Uh, a pro tip there maybe was I used our government, the Swedish government. So most governments, if you're coming from a country that has a good, uh, good ecosystem around this, they do have organizations that are there to help companies expand outside their country, especially smaller countries like Sweden that are reliant on export and exporting their business, you know, Ikea, Volvo, all that. Uh, so we use, it's called Business Sweden in our case, basically connect, connected to the Swedish embassy. They, they set us up in every country. Uh, so if you have something like that, reach out to them. They, and if they have a startup uh, venture going, which they had, uh, they knew they wanted to help. They've been helping Volvo and Ikea long enough, so now they wanted to help startups. So it was just perfect to have them introduce us and meet us at the markets. I landed in, in uh, Thailand. They pick us up at the airport. They, take a, they book up itinerary for a week. You're going to meet all these people. I met the ex-prime minister of something in Thailand. We went for a fancy dinner. That wasn't so valuable, but it was, it was kind of fun how we, they could set it up for us. Just they opened doors. It's a Swedish embassy. So that was really cool. That's I awesome. could go on for long. But. You could go on, but you talked about two things that I think not everyone thinks about. One is like leveraging a hack around, around um, search words. And the other is just um, leveraging what's around. And especially if you've got a proactive um, or supportive government um, that is, at, that is looking at this I'm from Australia, they have Austrade here as well. Um, it's not something that we all think about going back to. Um, so they're two really good tips. Vikram, um, what was your strategy for, you know, having, I remember when I saw you set up, one of the greatest things was you didn't spend a lot of money to prove the concept, which was great, um, you know, use of, of, of capital to, to, to see if, if, if your idea around the problem actually could be solved by, by that time, your solution around what you did here in Ansian in Singapore. But then there was like confidence from that to go and try this in other locations. What, what was the, the strategy that you deployed to look at, um, you know, the next step and the next step? So in all honesty, Nick, I, I wish I could say things have been strategic and well thought through, but the reality is a lot of it was just trial and error and really testing and uh, really just being ignorant. Um, and a lot of it was sort of luck and happenstance. Uh, but I, if I break down sort of our decisioning to two, two categories, I would say like one would be in the strategic category where you, you do a bit of analysis, like which market should we go to, et cetera. But a lot of it does fall into the emotional category, which is uh, sort of based on sort of like my personal preference. Uh, I'm, I'm an adventurous guy. I'm originally from, you know, I, I'm half Indian. My dad is from India. Uh, I'm half Burmese. My mom is Burmese. I grew up in California and I just wanted to travel to obscure, you know, uh, frontier markets. And that was, has always been my interest to explore, you know, South America, to explore the Eastern Europe and to explore, um, um, you know, Myanmar and, and, and all the frontier markets. Uh, that's just been my personal interest. And I, I suppose, um, one of the reasons why we're in some really frontier markets is because a there's an emotional interest from me to sort of explore these markets, but also the opportunity is uh, great because you know large large populations uh, and and we're thinking long term. So in ten years from now, can we make a difference in uh, the you know, economic development of these countries and and what what's going to really move the needle in terms of our mission? And uh, a lot of it comes down to like, what is it that we're really trying to do? What is our mission? And as a company, our mission, or we have a thesis, and the thesis is that if we can help create lots of businesses around the world, then the world will be a better place. 
And for me, I feel my contribution to the world should be something that I'm interested in, something that I'm having fun doing, and something that I feel will make a difference and give back to the world. So I want to create a million businesses around the world, and that's a company's mission. And, and so going to places like uh, frontier markets will, will sort of really drive the needle. So that all of these components play in a role into the, into the sort of equation of where we want to go. But um, strategically, uh, we are a hospitality company and we want to create a brand around the future of travel uh, to capture the new generation of sort of nomads. And so places like Bali makes a lot of sense because it is a digital nomad hub. Um, places like Chiang Mai makes sense. Um, you know, we would love to go to the islands in, in Thailand. Um, and so these sort of destinations have sort of become natural uh, hubs for people already. So for us to be there makes a lot of strategic sense. But, um, but a lot of it just sort of happened, uh, I would say, as you, as you put up a new space, you, you sort of learn what, what else you can do in a new city and, and you sort of gravitate towards that. But to your point in terms of trying to make capital more efficient, um, us putting up a space in say Yangon or putting up a space in Chiang Mai doesn't really in the big scope of things cost a lot of money. And we can learn, you know, we can learn design features, we can learn customer preferences, we can learn what works, what doesn't work by spending a hundred, $150,000, which then we can translate that learnings, those design functions to expensive cities like let's say Lisbon, which is not an expensive city, but it's more expensive than say Bali. Uh, and then hopefully when we get to a point where we've sort of created a, you know, a manual for how things should be done, then we can set up shop in London or in New York or, or you know, sort of more expensive cities. So um, long-winded answer, but some have been strategic, some have been very emotional. Sure, of course. And I think that's, that's the beauty of starting your own company is that you get a driving uh, option on, on where you go with it, whether it's because of passion or whether it's because of circumstance or, you know, pure strategy. Um, I'm going to ask you another question as well, and then I'm going to put it to, to Nima and Will, because it's come up a lot through the Impact Collective discussions I've been having with some of the founders, uh, where they're in one market and they're looking at the next, and, they're, and this will be very dependent on your business, um, and it will be, so I, I expect the answer to be quite different, but the concept of partnerships versus going it alone. Like, did you ever have those thoughts, Vikram, when you realized that you've got an opportunity in let's say Bangalore, Bali, like how are you, how are you approaching it with each of the, the steps that you've been taking to get to nine locations? Yeah, so, so I, I suppose this really, the answer depends on the type of business you're in, but for us, we're in a very physical, heavy, you know, real estate, leases, CapEx, design, renovation, uh, so it's very, very capital intensive and very um, uh, people intensive. Um, you know, you have to deal with, you know, construction and, and contractors. So there's a lot going on in our business. On top of that, we have the entrepreneurial ecosystem. You know, we have to do partnerships with accelerators, incubators, um, the, the universities. So it's, there's a lot of um, components to our business. It's very, very full stack. Um, building the foundation of the real estate piece on, and then on top of that we have all the the you know the the programs etc so for us it makes a lot of sense to do partnerships it's a lot easier to go into a new market when we went to bangalore we essentially um found a company that was similar to us in bangalore and we now we're 100 percent owners of the company but we acquired a piece of the company we rebranded and over time, we we you know we bought more more shares of the company, and now we're you know we're we've we've done share swaps, and so we're essentially one company now. But there is no way I could have gone into Bangalore by myself uh, because I didn't a know the the city, I didn't ha you know have the sort of networks and connections. So there we we got a partner uh, in Estonia. We got a partner uh, in Lisbon. We went at it alone, uh, which in hindsight we probably should have done more partnerships. But I, I'm, I'm, for us in our business, joint ventures um, are, is something that works for us. The difficulty, however, is to find the right partners, people that you trust, people that you have some sort of uh, you know, DNA match with. 
Um, and that's really the hardest part. So it really depends. I mean, for us doing joint ventures now makes sense because we don't have a lot of money. But if I had all the money in the world, I'd probably go at it alone because you sort of control your destiny. You know, if you get a, right now, we have issues with some partners where we're having fights. And, and so there's a lot of complications with partnerships. My preference would have been if I could do it by myself, I would prefer that. Um, but at this moment, uh, doing joint, joint venture partnerships is sort of our strategy. Sure. I mean, it's a factor of, of the capital constraint that we often all have to deal with as, as, we're, as we're sort of evolving and growing our business. Nima, I'm expecting a sort of somewhat different response just based upon the, what I know about Lendela. But um, when you went and looked at these markets, how did you approach? I mean, if, given especially like when you, when you talked about Malaysia and Thailand, very, very different cultures, very different you know, set of learning around, around the, the local market. Yeah, yeah. So again, like uh, different products, uh, so different answers. Uh, first of all, I needed local people. I need locals to help me. Thailand for sure, uh, Malaysia as well, Hong Kong as well. Uh, so uh, we're having some private chats going on <laughs> on my screen here. Uh, yeah. So um, so that's one thing. Of course, that's not a partnership, but in a sense, it became. Sometimes I like the Hong Kong manager I hired. He worked for free for for eight months. That I saw as a partnership, like he said, okay, I like what you're doing. Give me a chance to see if I can set it up in Hong Kong. And I, and I have all the, I could give him all the blueprints and all the, everything he needed to get it up and running, or at least do the on, on, on site uh, research. And then at the end of the eight months, it was like, okay, we have a business, let's go. And then, then we started a proper, he signed an employment contract and he, he joined us for real. Uh, that was a type of partnership. But our business relies on partnerships. I mean, I, I'm not, I need partnerships being lenders and banks. So, I mean, I can't do my business without having a partner on board from day one, uh, but it's different. Well, um, that's a different kind of, it's a, it's a, uh, it's a partner. It's, it's not a supplier, but it's a lender that I have to send traffic to and customers to. So that, is, that, that means we're forced to do partnership from day one, which I think is very good uh, to have to pr do that because that forces you to sell your product, that forces you to uh, learn to compromise, work with different kind of people in different cultures. I think, you know, our kind of product, a B2C product, you can just go dive into the product development and forget about the sales part, depending on what kind of entrepreneur you are. And you need both and no product can be sold. It has to be sold, but you know, someone has to sell it. So don't forget that. Um, another aspect of partnership is because we're a B2C service, we need, to, we need to have some trust in our brand, right? And we need to, customers come to our site, we ask them to fill out a form, give us their NRIC number, their salary. So we also use partnerships to build a brand. So if you go to Lendela and you look at the logos right now, we don't show lender logos necessarily. We show a couple of banks that's to build a brand and those are our partners. But then we show Carousel, which is a partner. I specifically signed Carousel as a partner for that reason, because I could be able to work with their brand. So we're on the carousel platform. Our CTR rates are much higher than if we do our marketing ourselves. Uh, so I do think about partnerships in a B2C space to a, a way to build brand as a startup, like a, as a hack, again, to build brand quickly. To develop some brand equity off the back of others who see the, the promise in what you're doing and, and, and give that some of, some of that sh shine and glow. That's very interesting. So Will, um, to, to sort of round out the thinking on, on this specific topic, that has been um, at the forefront of all the um, impact collective um, startups this week. Yeah, so I think um, I, I echo what Nima and Vikram is talking about. Um, the way that we look at partnerships or the way that we've been looking at uh, other markets is really two reasons. One is, you know, how do you build really unfair advantage um, when you don't have much? And the second is, how do you raise the right type of strategic capital? Um, so the reason why we went to China is because of our first round of funding, but then the reason why we went to the Middle East was because we um, we did a strategic partnership with the uh, Dubai government. And so, if I if you kind of you know backtrack why we left Singapore in the first place is it's because we we're trying to build a business from the ground up. And that's hard. You don't have the expertise, you don't have the reputation, and you just don't have as many assets. The reason why we came back is because you had that combination of both capital plus the reputation of working with, you know, distribution partners and government partners. Um, and now we're essentially in eight cities as we've started understanding how to best leverage partnerships in their own right. Um, 
my, I mean, one thing that I always try to look at for my team as we look to grow is how do you stay focused? So you're building a product and you're building a business that is repeatable and you're doing one or two things really well. Um, but then on the top layer of that is how do you actually identify um, the right type of, you know, strategic partners that can help you open doors and lift a lot of the weight off your chest. So, you know, in one case we work with co-working spaces to co-sell our co-learning products. Um, but we also look at, okay, if you have Western um, uh, investors from the US or from Europe that have a better understanding of how to arbitrage a market, how can you work with them to look at, you know, getting that leapfrog um, in Singapore and the, and the rest of Asia, because the Asian higher education landscape is still emerging. So I think it's a combination of push and pull. Um, most of it, it's been luck and timing and just putting yourself there. Um, similar to Vikram, I wouldn't say that, um, you know, we, we had a five year plan or two year plan and that's what we wanted to do. It just so happened that, oh, you know, Mercer's launching this accelerator. How do we you know, get our foot in the door to, you know, capture them as a client. This Dubai government thing, um, you know, is launching a education program. How do we, you know, get in front of them? Um, and I think it's a matter of how do you put yourself out there and put yourself in the position to have these opportunities, which is where I think Singapore um, does give a lot more of, you know, these inbound options to pick from. Um, the second part, um, I don't think we have talked enough about um, when Nemo was saying, um, how do you leverage networks? I agree. Like we, I haven't, I've built my entire database of partners, advisors, mentors by being planted in, the, in, in Singapore. Um, and so, you know, prior to coming to Singapore in Australia, it's, it would be so hard. Who do you, you know, talk to, how do you, you know, find the right introductions? Whereas, there's so many expats and um, nomads and, um, you know, founders have come in and gone. And so I, I do feel that, um, you know, just the openness of paying it forward and the openness to introduce you to another three people. And this becomes a, you know, um, recurring cycle of you building a better brand, building a better network and just confidence in being planted in one city or multiple cities at the same time. Yeah, I have to agree. I mean, I think Australia feels very clicky and closed minded at times in networks and the exact opposite of what you're saying. When I came to Singapore, I felt that everyone had been in the position of having to start out and knowing what it was like and, and um, being very open to saying, okay, we'll give you that meeting. It's not a big issue for us to take five minutes out of our day. That, that, that type of action and behavior is actually quite special part of this place. Um, we've got about 10 minutes left. I want to ask one more question back to Nima. And at the same time, there's a lot of people who've dialed in today. I want to give an option for the floor for any you know, questions that are coming from the group. Um, so as, you're, as, as I'm asking this question, Anima, please, please go into the chat feature um, and, and avail of the option to, to put a question to the group if, well, with the time we have. Um, Nima, it's back to the uh, point about, uh, which, which I think we've been talking about in many ways around Singapore as a safe haven. Um, when it's a safe haven, it's also thought about as a small market. Everyone says, look, it's only 5 million people. And, and for whatever business, it's overbanked, it's overserved, you know, it's, it's over, you know, people consume a lot here. So it's a difficult place. You've got to be getting out to Indonesia. You've got to be getting out to Thailand. You made that comment before. Can you talk about how you found a way in making Singapore a viable option for your business to grow as, you, as you're developing Lendala? Oh, yeah, you can answer that. Overbanked, a lot of consumption. <laughs> like, great, great market for us. <laughs> and no, I mean, it, I, I don't think it's uh, the best market for everyone, of course. But let's take, I mean, just numbers. In uh, MAS doesn't uh, report numbers every year. The Monetary Authority of Singapore, where we can you know understand how much lending is happening. But just the money lenders, you know, these shops you see on the streets here that are. We're not talking about the banks. That's like more than half of the uh, business. But just the money lenders are dispersing more than three hundred thousand loans per year in Singapore. So. I compare that to Sweden, which is like 150,000. Uh, there, there's a huge opportunity. That's just money lenders. That, and that's a, that's a part of the lending space that is ripe for disruption and that demands more transparency because they are not always taking care of customers the right way. Um, so I, I, I would say like at a first glance, when you look at a market, don't just uh, fall for the population numbers, right? Like uh, Indonesia's X hundred, 300 something million or Vietnam's you know, or the, the Thailand's, which we did. 
uh, but, but also look at like be, be beneath the numbers, like how, what is the competition uh, and how much um, in our case, we're looking at like the loan amounts, so how, how large are the loan amounts. We can do uh, one loan in Singapore because we're getting commission on the loan, it's a trade secret between us, but we're getting commission on the loan amount and the loan amount is 20 times bigger here than it is in Thailand. So I have to do 20 times as many loans in Thailand than you know, in a simple calculation. Um, so to take, don't go deeper than just looking at, yeah, Singapore is a small market in number of people. I think I'm, uh, thanks to me coming from Sweden, a small market and seeing this model. And as you mentioned, it, there's two players that are unicorns in Sweden. So it's, uh, and they're highly profitable, highly, highly well run businesses. So I came kind of already kind of re mindset ready that a small market is not necessarily something bad. I don't need to avoid that. Um, yeah, I think that's, uh, I don't have much, I just, it's so funny. I, I mean, my markets ended up being Singapore and Hong Kong, the, the ones that maybe most people would say you wouldn't, you shouldn't do, but they're actually doing well. And also COVID, I mean, uh, now um, I just wanted to, I mean, look at the world. I think Singapore and Hong Kong are two of the best markets you can be in right now, not just the number of cases, but also how the governments are like it, it, supporting the, the population and the ecosystem and the businesses. And so it's been very, I've been very grateful being in Singapore these months. Um, from personal perspective and business. Absolutely. So I think that's a great summary of some of the thoughts around Singapore. Um, in addition, um, you know, I think the point that a lot of you on the call, if you're talking with investors, um, there's, there is that question around the addressable market. Um, so whether you use Singapore is just a, a base for, for setting up operations and, and from the call before with Daniel about optimizing for tax and, you know, good treatment on dividends and everything that, that it offers, um, it can also be a successful base for operations if you've um, if you've got the opportunity with your business. Um, it's there's a question here from Marku about what's the best way to network and get to know great entrepreneurial people in Singapore in these current times. Vikram, you've got one. Easy, and they, easy. Oh, I got that one. Well, you got to just come to Draper Startup House. Is it <laughs> Marku Kiro? Hey, uh, we're at 39 Ansiang Road. We're open from nine to seven. Just come on in and and meet lots of cool people. I have to say, every time I do come to Drove to Startup House, I do meet someone who's actually open to a chat, whether they're from a different business, whether they're coming to raise funds. I mean, everyone does actually get along here quite well and is quite open to telling their story. So it is a, a great space uh, for Nick, that. Nick, um, what, what, if I can just add one quick point to your question on the addressable market in Singapore. You know, I, it's very ironic because you're right. If we're selling washing machines or, you know, or cars in Singapore, yeah, there's a ceiling to, you know, how many machines you can sell, right, to the population. But interestingly, for Draper Startup House, for us, we have probably touched more of our target audience being in Singapore than being in Bali or being in Bangalore or being in, you know, Austin. Because when we started this small, tiny backpacker hostel here in Singapore, we would have thousands of people just coming through the space, traveling through Singapore because it's a hub, right? So they're, they're, it's, it's a layover or that's where the connections are uh, for, for airlines uh, or they, they're just coming here for a couple of days of tourism. We had, we, we literally in this tiny space had guests from 176 countries in one year. And, and you know, like touching that many countries, people from that, those, that many cities around the world is something that you, you necessarily, actually, there's not many cities in the world that you could say that, yeah, that happens in the city. So, so even though the population of addressable market is very small, in terms of like networks, it's a great place to, to come in connection with, with, uh, with global people. Very true. Uh, we've all seen that, especially, but um, I didn't realize it was 176. That's amazing. Well, we, we can wrap up in the next couple of minutes. Is there any sort of final thoughts from the three of you about the topics we've discussed or any, any closing thoughts? Um, yeah, so I, I'll, I'll just tap on to uh, that point around um, the dress mark. I agree that the only sort of, you know, it really depends on your North Star metric. Um, because if you look at the type of business that you want to build, it's really dependent. Do you want to go to a high scale market where, you know, you're focusing on B2C or do you want to go to a decision maker market that, um, you know, where people can write the checks or people are able to give you that distribution. So in the case of new campus, 
a lot of education training decision makers are based in either Hong Kong, Singapore, or Australia. So most likely they are looking across the region. And so you kind of need to look at Singapore, not just as a standalone city, but a city that can help you open doors and open decisions across, um, you know, other parts of uh, Asia. Uh, in terms of the second part, Marku, um, your question around networking, I've found with COVID, it's just very easy to jump on a call nowadays, um, which is why I've obviously our business has flourished um, because, you know, people are learning more virtually, but, um, you know, individuals are more open to just jump on a 30 minute Zoom call, um, you know, reach out, uh, reach out to someone on LinkedIn in Singapore, ask to jump on a, you know, 30 minute virtual coffee and, you know, try to get some introductions out of that. I, I think that's really been shifted. It, that's really shifted um, the way that I've approached doing sales and business development, even fundraising now. My co-founder, she's been jumping on Zoom calls and, you know, closing um, closing deals off, you know, a couple of Zoom calls. So I do think you should take the, um, take the most out of you can um, over the next couple of months um, before COVID gets lifted. Um, because people are open to, you know, having open conversations um, with new people. Vikram, what's the name of the dating app that you've been using? Not for dating, but for work. Oh, yeah. De <laughs> well, it is, it's professional dating. Uh, Lunch Club. I, so I, I recently got invited to join Lunch Club by a friend, and I was very skeptical, but it's been really, really awesome. I've met really good business partners on, on lunch club so yeah that's that's a good one check it out i mean i i, I guess it depends on what city you're in whatnot but nowadays as as will mentioned because it's all you can do a zoom call you can meet some really cool people on on lunch club highly recommended fantastic nima i promised you would finish at 12 15 because you've got a hard stop is there anything you'd like to finish up with these <laughs> yeah i'm going for the ultrasound for my first baby so <laughs> very important you're on time um, no, I, I was trying to, first of all, I was trying to remember how did we connect? Like, I mean, that was, an, that was, that was somehow we, uh, somehow, was it, was it the Swedish embassy that somehow found you guys? I think it was. Someone from Sweden. Yeah, so that, that was a uh, way to connect for Yeah, so people are open. Uh, that's, that's actually how that's happened a lot here. Yeah, uh, but uh, regarding the total addressable market, uh, just one thing, I, we, you and I spoke about this uh, earlier too, or uh, um, a couple of days ago about this. Um, 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 I, I really like it. Like I said, I think you shouldn't like just dis discard Singapore as a market for your business. But I really like that we went regional immediately from the beginning because what happened was the company culture, Lendela's company culture, without me even thinking about it, became a regional company culture where the, everything, uh, the team is just thinking like it's more than Singapore. Uh, and, and we're very comfortable. We've done four markets now. So we're very comfortable when I want to do the fifth one, I feel. Compared to imagine if I had done Singapore for like two, three years, and then the investors are pushing us, you need to do the next market, otherwise you can't, you know, funders. And then it would be such a stretch. A team has been Singapore focused, Singapore mindset. Uh, so I'm, I like that, that we did that. Otherwise, it's all, it could be dangerous doing multiple markets at once, right? It's, uh, you lose focus. So that's a big lesson. But that, that, I mean, if you're doing, like, don't get too, basically, Singapore is a comfortable place, right? So don't get too comfortable here. Uh, force yourself out of this country. I think because we all three of us seem to have done that, no one really gave that perspective. It's just a given uh, that we've done it. Uh, but I think that's good to know. And also the whole total addressable market, it's a, it's a VC thing for me. It's like, you know, you want, they, they, they're thinking unicorns, but I mean, think about it. I mean, think about what you're trying to build, what kind of company you're trying to build. Yeah, if you want to be a unicorn, maybe Singapore isn't enough. Out of there are products where it is, but but not everyone has to be a unicorn. If you want to build a good business, look at it from that perspective as well and decide first. That's a topic for another day, about choosing your investor. Um, but yes, I think when we do have that challenge, I mean, I've worked on the investor side and as much as you've got to placate you know, a decision maker, they're not always as smart as you think they are. So <laughs> I'll, I'll leave it on, on that for today. Um, if, if, um, if anything, I'd like to thank you for all for your time um, in the audience and obviously um, from, from your side then, Nima and uh, Will and Vikram. Um, we'll be taping this and sharing it with the Impact Collective community. Um, there's some people who couldn't join today who are, are keen to watch this on the weekend. Thanks again for your time and for everyone for joining. Have a great day. Yep. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye, everyone. Thank you.